time, huh? Is that how we're feeling? Like, is that? We'll try again. Yeah, yeah. Christmas time. Yeah, you can be okay. Anytime. Newsflash for the kiddies in the room. At some point, you're going to have to publicly speak, and uh, you might have teachers that make you bad at it, and that's fine. But let me just give you a piece. Of, it's not my notes. This is for free for all the youngsters in the room. Learn to publicly speak, and here's a trick. Every audience in the Midwest will cheer for anything if you ask them to twice. This, I'm just literally everything. So that's why every, almost every sermon, if, if a guy's older than me, they'll come up and they'll say, good morning. Good morning. And then everyone's like, oh, no, good morning. See, so that's your trick, right? And so ask something twice and I'm excited. Not everyone's excited about Christmas, but they are because I asked twice, right? Huh? You're welcome. Do this for all of your education classes coming forward in presentations. Wow. What an awful intro. Man. Welcome to Christmas. Hey, um, I, every time we talk about, we're going to take a break from John. I feel the need to say that. Um, we've been doing John most of the year, and then here we are now. We're going to do uh, walk into our Advent season. And I just, I've got to express how much I love these years where Advent starts the week after Thanksgiving. Because what happens is sometimes you have Thanksgiving, and then instantly we've got to tell them, like, guys, we've got, we got four weeks starting today. Come on, Advent, let's go. It just feels so rushed. But see, now everyone can take a breath. <sighs> Technically, the first week of Advent is until December 3rd, right? And that's a week from today. So we get to talk about it this morning. We get to prepare for it. We get to think through it. Much of uh, how all of history was preparing to celebrate this moment, we get to take time to prepare for it. I'm excited about that. Christmas season can create a, a lot of questioning, doubts. You've heard me talk about this before. I think the first Advent season I did here, I referred to this. But this image might be familiar to some of you all. Um, it's from a, a classic Christmas show. Potentially, it might be there. Sometime, there it is. Does anyone know this? Yeah, someone said it. Who is that guy? Yeah, that's old Charlie Brown. Does it, is anyone so familiar with this movie they know exactly what's happening in this scene? I want to hear it. What is he saying in this moment? Yeah, he's saying, is, it, is there anybody... Is there anybody that can tell me what Christmas is all about? And then, oh, you get the most, man, this scene redeemed Christmas for me. I had some tensions in my angry, more millennial years of life, and I was like, ah, oh, everything's stupid, right? And then I watched this movie for like the thousandth time, and it just really appealed to me that Linus just, he says, yeah, just so nonchalantly, yeah, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. And then he comes and he, what's he do? He reads scripture. He just quotes the story from Luke, I believe. It's incredible. So um, I feel the need every time we approach Advent to do something like this, to just express, like, man, can anyone tell me what Christmas is all about? Like, like and of course, you know, you're, uh, sorry, spoiler alert, Jesus is the reason for the season. Put it on a bumper sticker. Boom, right? But we want to talk about that. Why? Why does that matter? I'm going to start with a uh, unpopular Christmas story, um, not because it's risque or problematic or anything. It's just not a, a thing you think about during Christmas time. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel, you have, and then we're going to bounce all over the Bible. In Daniel, you have this situation where Israel has, has been, uh, they've already been divided in tents, and then Babylon comes in and attacks Jerusalem, and they take some exiles out. Um, that's where you get Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, those, those people, and they plunder the city and the temple. It, it's just a mess. It's a sad time. And Nebuchadnezzar, who's, who's the ruler king, I don't know what you'd call him, he's the ruler of Babylon, uh, emperor maybe, I don't, I don't know how Babylonian culture works, but he's the big guy, and he keeps having this dream, and he tells tells all of the, they, they call them wise men, but they also list different things about them, you know, whether they're sorcerers or whatever. And he says, hey, tell me my dream. And they're like, well, you, you tell me your dream and we'll interpret it. And he's like, nah, tell me my dream or I'm going to kill you. And they're like, ah, why don't you just tell us the dream? Then we'll tell you the interpretation. He's like, no, I'm putting my foot down. You're going to tell me the dream. Other, you're a, you're a fake or phony. He actually says he's going to rip them in quarters, like have horses rip them apart, I think. It's, it's incredible. We didn't read that part because it's not very Christmassy. But um, so then uh, they all leave and he, he just goes and he just kills all these different leader, uh, um, religious type leaders, um, sorcerers. They're all going to die. And then Daniel steps in and God gives him the interpretation of this dream of Nebuchadnezzar. He actually literally tells him what the dream was. No one told him. God told Daniel then he goes. Here's what we do. Daniel chapter 2, verse 31 through 35. Daniel talking to Nebuchadnezzar. You saw, O king, 
And behold, a great image. This image, mighty of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of the image was of fine gold, and its chest arms of silver, and its middle was size of bronze. Its legs were iron, its feet were part iron and part clay. This is a statue full of different metals, lessening and hardness and power and all that. You can study that and get really excited about that. As you looked, here's it, listen, a stone was cut out by no human hand. Say, no human hand. Yeah, a stone was cut by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold, all together were broken in pieces and became like chaff in the summer threshing floor, like dust. Oh, we are as dust in the wind. Like, she's gone. Poof, right? You don't get that quote every Sunday. Chaff, summer threshing floor, it's gone. The wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image, the one that was made by no human hand, the one that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Mountains in the Old Testament are dwelling places of God, just so you know, just to cover a huge theme that we could talk about a million times. Uh, Eden was on a mountain. Uh, You hear the high places. On the high places is where these different kings started building um, altars to to Baal and Asherah is a big tension, and then some kings tore them down because high places, mountains, connect to where you can dwell with God, right? Um, And so there's a tension here. And so here, of course, this becomes a mountain because we're getting back to Eden. That's the whole idea. And so Daniel, in the mix of all this, Daniel's telling him this prophecy. And for Daniel, this sounds pretty good because he understands, man, all these kingdoms keep taking our people, keep crushing us. But one day, a stone, something representing the the Jerusalem on a hill, something, all this God stuff, it's going to come and it's going to crush all of this. And the king was really pumped about this. Later on, Daniel 2, 44, he says, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. There is a kingdom that's going to come that can never be destroyed, and it's going to overthrow, shadow, dust in the wind, all the other kingdoms. They're going to lose all their authority, their power. Because in, in this culture, they understood power, land, space, that's what defined a kingdom. And these are going to be crushed so much so they can't even remember. They're like dust in the wind. Poof, they're gone. Later on, Daniel 7, Daniel himself has a a vision, and he says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. What's the number one way Jesus refers to himself? Son of man, you got it. Yep, good, good. We taught this before. <clears throat> and he came to the ancient of days and was presented, presented, sorry, before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and light. Listen to this. All peoples. Hebrews. These are, these, are, these are Israelites who are seeing this vision. They're writing this. All peoples is really important. All nations, these things are really important to us because we tend to get a little more focused on our people, our time, our nation. This is all about us. This is all, oh, this is our time. Now we're in the end times. Hold on. No, no, no. The Bible is just pretty clear here. All peoples, nations, and languages should serve him, this king. Uh, this this uh, son of man is going to unify. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, can never go away, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Nothing can overthrow it. It lasts forever, and he brings everyone together. Isn't that beautiful? This is the hope. Some years later, we get Haggai, we read earlier. The desire of the nations, a good ruler. If I asked you right now, I will actually ask you. I'm going to tell you I'm going to ask you so the introverts get some time to get ready that they might have to say something out loud. Here in a few seconds, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, here we go. Uh, I'm going to ask you, when you think of a good leader, you can think of your favorite president or whatever. Now, take a step back. Maybe you're thinking of Steve Jobs. That's fine. Take a step back. Um, what are traits of a good leader or a good ruler? Consistency. Consistency. Honesty. Ooh. Loyal. Loyal. De- decisiveness. Vision. Vision. Leadership. Leadership. Charisma, I like that. Yeah, they can communicate well. They, they're winsome. Ah, I like that. I wrote that one down thinking that no one else would say it. Me and Wade, we're on it. Relatable. Relatable, yeah. So I'm interested that um, when you watch movies like the best movie, Lord of the Rings, and you're all about the return of the king, um, which is super on the nose for this sermon, right? But um, there's this understanding that whoever is king is full of flaws and maybe some good things. Either they're fully bad, 
with a little bit of good things, or they're really good with a few bad things, right? And so you can think about um, King Solomon versus King David and, and kind of the mixing there, King Saul. There's like a mixing going on of this good and bad. And every king studies kings before them so they can don't repeat the bad stuff but keep the good stuff, but we keep having bad rulers. We might be able to uh, arguably decide on the top three presidents that have ever existed in America, but we're so limited because do, do any of us really know George Washington? Let's be honest. Does anyone know George Washington? A blanket. We don't know these people, so we don't really know, but all leaders have a mix, and we have things that we want, and the Bible steps in and says, hey, you know what? There's going to be a leader who unifies everyone, who brings everything made right. All nations, all people groups, they're coming together. And their kingdom won't be destroyed. It'll last forever. There's this hope in Scripture. There's no ruler or king or anyone that we know that's ever been able to do this that we can look at. But God says he will bring an eternal kingdom. Many years later, as we celebrate during this time, God comes down as a man. Uh, God sent his son, Jesus, to live amongst us. Uh, and he miraculously checks all these boxes. We might be talking more about that next week. But there are all these prophecies that he's just like, man, back to back to back. Everything that the Messiah is supposed to be, this guy is. And, and immediately from, see, my favorite thing about Jesus is that all the outsiders are the first to get it. I remember uh, someone asked me this last week, why are the Magi such a big deal? Like, what's the big deal with that? It's like, man, can you imagine? The people who aren't supposed to care at all are the people who show up. Like, they're outsiders. Right? They're, not, they're not Hebrews. They're not, they're not Israeli. They, they just show up to, to be there because they hurt. Man, there's this idea that Jesus is bringing in people from the beginning. He's bringing in nations and languages that serve him. And Jesus goes around teaching about what? We've talked about this. Um, I used to put this on the board every week when we go through Sermon on the Mount. When I say Jesus, you say... You Jim always got it first. I'm going to do it again, though, so maybe someone can beat Jim. When I say Jesus, you say... Ooh, Cohen got you there. So, uh, so youth, what do you do? So, Jesus came about teaching the kingdom. Mark 1.15, it's one of my favorite verses in Scripture. Jesus says, the time is fulfilled. Everything you've been waiting for, poof, here it is. It's fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. All that Old Testament stuff, the, the, the king that you thought, the ancient of days, the, the, the vision of, uh, from Nebuchadnezzar, the stone that's going to be hit, it's the mountain that's going to come up, it's at hand. The kingdom of God is now. Jesus puts that on himself. He goes around teaching and showing us in his actions what hope, peace, joy, love, everything, what everything is supposed to be. Jesus lives a perfect life. He teaches people what it means to truly live. That's what we've been going through John. We're going to finish going through John in our church at some point, and then we're going to get to actually what we're going to call just practicing the way. How do we follow living like Jesus? Because Jesus is the way, and that's what Jesus was teaching us. This is what it means to truly be human. And after Jesus dies, three days later, he miraculously rises again. He's alive. Say, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive, and when he stands with his disciples, we could cover this small verse in Matthew twenty-eight seventeen that says, they're worshiping him, but some doubt it. I think that's so fascinating, because some of us come to Jesus, and we, we have some doubts, we have some struggles, but we're still coming to Jesus. And, and as they're coming and worshiping, and some of them doubting, here's what Jesus says. The whole idea was that, that God would give the desire of the nations, and, and that he would fill his glory in the temple, his presence would be with people, and Jesus says... All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. So go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe what I've commanded you. And remember, Emmanuel, I'm with you always. Matthew starts saying that he will be with his people. He'll be Emmanuel, God with us. And Matthew ends, the last verse of Matthew is... I am with you always. God's presence is here. His kingdom has no end. And it turns out then Jesus shows us that really all the corruption, all the brokenness was never just having the right power or political system. It was never having the right democracy or, or uh, hierarchy. It was never about... Actually, the problem is that at our hearts, at a fundamental level, humans are corrupt, sinful, broken. We're full of iniquity, sin, and transgression. There's a word in Hebrew for even sins you don't even realize you commit. You're just broke. You're breaking the law. Without really, you're doing things against God. You don't even realize that's iniquity, right? And, and Jesus comes and says, no, no, no. That's 
that's what I'm going to overthrow. That's what lasts forever. Because no longer are we going to have a place where everything is made a mess by your selfish rebellion, your evil desires. And so later, the church, as it's born, empowered by His Spirit, His presence literally in them, they write things about King Jesus like this. 1 Timothy 6.15 Jesus, who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Paul writes in Philippians, So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Revelation 1, 5 starts out like this. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And in the end, you get this picture of the city coming down, Jerusalem coming down. And Jesus says, Revelation 21, 5 and 6, and he who is seated on the throne says, behold, which is a word that means look, pay attention, focus in, get in here guys, look at this, focus Behold, I am making all things new. I'm making all things new. Write this down. These words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. So much philosophy in those words. My goodness. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus, seated on the throne, says, look at me. Focus on me. Get in here. Look. Hey, look. I am making all things new. Trust me. I am everything. Focus on me. I'm making all things new. Trust me. I'm everything. So as we walk into the holidays and we begin to wrestle through what this looks like to celebrate this holiday time and, and, and to think, what does it mean that Jesus is the reason for the season? We can look back on all. We can dig deep cuts. There's Sunday school teachers here that could give you Old Testament prophecies till you're blue in the face. We can talk about all these things that connect. It's incredible. You've seen the image we've shown before. There's over 63,000 interconnections in Scripture, which is unlike any document in history. Not even close. The Bible is so unique. Incredible. Amazing. Nothing like it. It's almost like God himself wrote it. And he's communicating to us, there is a king and a kingdom. And it's set apart from all the junk that you're looking towards. Don't be distracted by Nebuchadnezzar, by by this country, that country. Don't be distracted by these things that that are pulling you because one day they're all going to crumble to dust. And every tribe, tongue, and nation, every people group, they're going to be unified and serve the true king, King Jesus. And the Bible tells us that will be a world apart from sin, suffering, death. Revelation 21 before that says there'll be no more tears. He'll wipe away every tear. There'll be no more death, no more pain. He's going to remove all those things. But the holidays are an interesting time. So this is all true, right? Can I get an amen? Amen. Cool. We're about, about what? Two-thirds of the way through, whatever. I don't know how sermons work. But uh, so, you know, amen, that's all true. Now come down to practicality. Y'all got Monday, Tuesday coming up, and then you got December 1st, we got Christmas time, you're making plans. You might be just busy out your ears right now. So much going on. I hope, I've been thinking about this. This is how I've been thinking about it, and I hope it helps you. See, it's a present. Get it? I don't know the significance of that. I just thought the box should be wrapped, because having a Huggies diaper box up here didn't quite make sense. This is, uh... The first pastor jacket I ever bought. Say pastor jacket. I, uh, whew. I worked on not being too emotional about talking about this jacket. We don't have time. But, ha, come on. Uh, I was leading worship in, uh, at the lake with a buddy of mine. And I found out that uh, uh, Leona Sullivan had passed. And I realized, oh, I don't own a suit. <laughs> And, and like, I'm, I, I, I need to be present, I need to be here, and I need to, and, and I, I knew Leona well enough to know she would want me to wear a suit. And, and so I was like, man, I, I gotta go get a suit. And Kevin Stoltz was like, hey, J.C. Penney's has a sale on Michael Strahan suits where you won't look like a blocky pastor, because that was my goal. I didn't want to look like a, you know, just some whatever. So I didn't even know Michael Strahan, but apparently he knows how to wear suits. So uh, I went and I bought that suit. And, and so this suit is gray, because that's the color of such things. And you know, I've wore this suit for weddings. 
I wore it at the Grand Hotel on an anniversary day with my wife on Mackinac Island, Mackinac, depending on how you want to pronounce it. I've wore it to galas, a lot of weddings, but the primary function of this coat to me, when I look at it, I think about funerals. And I can get to the other memories. I can think through the other good things, and, and like, like how most grief works. You can work to think about the good things. But, but the primary thing I remember, I look at this coat, is funerals that I've done, times of gray, um, uh, when, when people were trying to fight for joy, fight for peace, to believe that, that love is in the room, to hope past the hardness there. And, and so uh, this coat reminds me of that. This coat... This coat's brand new. <laughs> this coat reminds me of smiling. Uh, when I was much more younger and insecure and I couldn't quite figure out how in the world I married up to such a wonderful woman that is Nikki Newton. Uh, and I just would ask her all the time in deep insecurity, why are you attracted to me? Why are you here? She would constantly say without missing, you know what she would say, anyone guess? Money? No. That's funny. Oh, gosh. Wow. Uh, no. Um, I'm definitely very blessed uh, uh, being the pastor here, but that's, that's not why Nikki married me. Uh, she, she would say, you're funny. And I would respond, great, I'm a stinking clown. Neat. Ah, I'm funny. But I think this is kind of where she's going. For me, like, uh, this is happy. This is, why would you not own this? Raise your hand if you would never own this. Yeah, I know who you are. You're going to wear it today, though. We're going to have picture time up here. But I just, like, I got to have it. Like, like, why not? And my mom got it for me. It's, it's so great. Some of you walk into the holidays, and this is all you can wear. And, and you're here, and, and you're saying, you know, I understand that we've got to deck the halls and bake cookies. But here's the reality. Things are gray, and things are hard. And, and, and like a lot of grief, this might be the first holiday without some family member that you love. And it might not even be about someone you've lost. It might be about an ideal that's gone. An ideal of your family. An ideal of a job. An ideal of, of, of being healthy. Some ideal that's broken. And, and so you're wearing this and you're walking around the holidays and maybe you're trying, but it's just gray and it's difficult. And we want to lean into that we don't want to avoid that. We want to lean into it as a church, a Delphoi, family five, as one body, and say, get in here. Because there is a king on the throne that he promises to bring joy and hope and peace and love. And, and you've experienced some of those things in life. You can be wearing this coat and you can think back on, there was a time when there was hope, when there was joy, when there was peace, when there was love. There, and maybe you can. Maybe your life has always been terrible. It's always sucked. But, but maybe you at least have the hope in you that, hey, things could be hopeful. I've seen movies. I've seen heroes win. I've seen good guys try. You, you want love. You want peace. You, you want those things. You want to have joy. And so you're, you're trying to hold on to that, but it's just, just not there. You've experienced those things. The Bible would tell us that we're caught in between two advents here. We waited for a king to come. King Jesus came and he's making all things new. You've experienced love in the past and you can experience love this holiday because you know one day you're going to fully experience love because the king is on the throne. You've experienced peace in the past and you can experience peace this holiday because you understand that one day you'll fully experience peace because King Jesus is on his throne. You've experienced joy in the past, and so you can fight for joy this year because you know that one day you'll fully experience joy because King Jesus is on his throne. You've experienced hope in the past, and now you can hope this year because you hope King Jesus is on the throne. Listen, lean in. This isn't to minimize or belittle your pain. I'm not dangling the carrot that says, look to Jesus. You don't have to worry or be sad. No, no, no. Lean into your pain. No one here is trying to minimize. Look around. When people know about Memorial, when, when people give feedback to us about our church, is, is that we are authentic. The reason people leave and sometimes come back and all they realize, hey, we are a bunch of scalawags that actually look to Jesus. We have people here that have maybe never touched a drop of whatever bad stuff. And then we have people who can't get within a foot of it or they're going to relapse every second. And neither one of them is looking about how bad or worse they are, how better they are than other people, because we recognize that Jesus is king. We have people in here that have all kinds of struggles, all kinds of broken, that are questioning and doubting 
shouting, and we gather here authentically to look to Jesus because he's on the throne. That's why we're here. And so this season, if this is where you're at, if you're, you're wearing the gray, if things are hard, you look to Jesus and you say, only through Jesus can I experience love, joy, peace, hope. Only Jesus can bring those things because only he died and resurrected. He is alive. He is king. And so it doesn't have to be about me. I can look to Jesus. Maybe, maybe this is how you approach the holidays. Give me a minute as I suit up. I feel like Elvis in Las Vegas. That was a little more rain dance than Elvis, but you get it. Um, Yeah! You just feel great in this thing. You're going to have to wear it later. Maybe this is you. You've already got your tree up. You're like, I'm decking the halls like Mike Tyson in his prime. I'm like so ready to go. I've got, I've got glitter spitting out of my ears, just green and red. My Christmas lights are up. My tree's already trimmed. I'm just like, Christmas, right? Say it. Say Christmas. You're so excited, right? And, and maybe that's you. And you're like, this is it. But I, I want to remind you because sometimes that so quickly can turn into what? These, these expectations of, of what we make it, about how, how I think family ought to be this way and I've got to do this, and all of a sudden you get pulled into hurriness and busyness and, and the, these tense expectations. And celebration, pazow, turns into tension and darkness and loss and, and, and frustration. I want to remind you that love, joy, peace, and hope, it's not on you. You aren't the one who brings ultimate love, joy, peace, hope to your family, to your holiday events, no matter how glittery your jacket is, no matter how great you cook the ham, or how much you mess up all the holiday experiences, no matter how sick your inflatables are, you don't bring love, joy, peace, and hope. Only King Jesus does that. Only he's on the throne. And so here we walk into the holidays, and and maybe, maybe you're the cool cucumber in the room, and you're like, you know what? Uh, pfft, I don't know where I am. I'm just like, I'm here. I tucked in my shirt today. I buttoned my sleeves. And I'm just like, I'm not quite. I don't know how to process this. I don't even know, gosh, how do people even get there? Uh, and maybe that's your thing. I, don't, I need to figure it out. Stop trying to figure it out. Because no one's here to say this is gold or this is gold or this is where you need to be. Stop finding identity and being in the middle saying I'm going to avoid my junk because I don't want to process it. I'm, I'm going to not get too excited because I know just more junk's going to come. Stop. The goal in Christ is not to be here, here, or here. These are just postures. These are things that happen. The goal that we want to shepherd is that you take the gray of this time, you take the gray of your brothers and sisters in Christ who aren't in the same place you are or who are in the same place you are and and you take the celebration and the pizzazz and the joy and you recognize that your celebration without recognizing Christ's execution and, and exaltation rising from the dead, King Jesus on the throne, your celebration means nothing without Jesus. It's just celebration. You'll come and die. Your Christmas stuff will be sold. Someone else will buy it at a garage sale. All of grandma's decorations might get passed on or they'll get broken eventually. Everyone will forget about it. But King Jesus is still on his throne. The sadness and brokenness you experience is here. But the Bible reminds us that these things are temporary and they all point to that one day God's going to make all things new. You embrace these things and you look and you say, King Jesus is on his throne. The one who is seated on the throne says, Behold, I am making all things new. Write these things down. Trust my words. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We've said each year that Advent is proclaiming the sufficiency of Christ through the discipline of waiting. Some of us are waiting for things to get better. Hoping this year is better than the last. It's been a long December. Some of us are just only so focused on celebration. We're actually currently being crushed by it. Just so much expectation and tension. When are we getting the Christmas lights up? But Advent is proclaiming the sufficiency of Christ for waiting. We're waiting for him to fully 
Give us our celebration. We fully experience love, joy, peace, hope. We're experiencing it now, and it all points to who He is. We're fully experiencing it. Or we're waiting for the moment when these things are no more. When there's no more pain, He wipes away every tear. All of a sudden, celebration makes more sense. Grief makes more sense. We're proclaiming the sufficiency of Christ through the discipline of waiting. We're caught between advents. We're waiting for Him to make all things new because Jesus says... Behold, look, focus, I make all things new. Not you, not your culture, not your grief, not your shiny, shine, hype, celebration, Christmas and flame. Behold, I make all things new. Trust me, I am everything. So as we try to embrace this, where do we go from here? Cute analogy, neat suits, fun sparkly stuff. Here's what you're going to do. Here's what we're going to do together, church. When we say, how do we do this? You know, there's one thing that the disciples who followed Jesus, they specifically asked him. There are a lot of things that, that Jesus did. And they didn't say, teach us to cast demons out by just saying some words. They didn't say, teach us to have people touch our clothes and then they're healed from hemorrhaging. No, no, no. They said, Jesus, teach us to... Pray. And here's where we get this very cherished, valuable prayer. It's in Matthew 6. Jesus says, pray like this. Here's how you pray. As a good rabbi would teach, here's how you pray. Say, our Father. When we say our Father, we are acknowledging that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. The very declaration of our Father recognizes that there is a Father who loves you, who has called you, who has brought you in. Everything good you ever experienced in life is because He is a good Father who loves you. And we say together, our Father. He is our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Utterly unique is a good definition of hallowed. Very special, beyond anything. In fact, the, the Hebrews couldn't even have a word for this, so they tacked on holiness, right? The idea of holiness, like just beyond what we can measure. So far unique and set apart. Everything beyond what we think about political leaders, about brokenness, about happiness, about, about the, the, all the Christ stuff. You are hallowed. Our Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a prayer that starts by declaring that the Father loves you and has drawn you in. He is with you because He says, I'm with you always. He has brought you in through Jesus. And then it's a prayer that quickly remembers that He is above us. He sees things differently. He's utterly unique. And then it's a declaration. May your kingdom come. Not my kingdom. Not America's kingdom. Not Ukraine. Not Russia. But may your kingdom come. Not my family. Not my ideals. Not my sick Christmas deer backstrap smoke. Like, like, no, no, may your kingdom come. That's what gets priority. That's what's first. And so, as a response, in a few seconds, Nathan's going to come up here. And he's going to start, he's going to start just playing music. And we're going to start the holidays as a church, recognizing that Jesus is the center. That all authority on heaven and earth has been given to him. That Jesus says, get in here, focus, look to me. I am everything. You can trust me. I am making all things new. Wherever you find yourself this holiday, the highs, the lows, the anxieties, the tensions, the grief, the blue Christmas, the hardship, wherever you find yourself, the celebration, Jesus is on the throne. He's making all things new. So as Nathan plays... I would encourage you to pray the Our Father with your neighbor. Turn to someone next to you. Move around. You have three to four minutes. We're going to dim the lights a little bit. And, and I would just encourage you as a church to lean in. We're not just a church where Pastor David says a bunch of things and hopes that you guys do it. We do these things because it's who we are. And, and so if you can't, if that's like, I just can't, I can't even. Pray that God would guide you in this time. Maybe God will send someone to you. I don't know what the Lord's going to do. Or just open your hands and, and pray to yourself recognizing that He is our Father. But I would encourage you to take three or four minutes and pray together that His kingdom would come and His will would be done. Whatever your highs are, whatever your lows are of the coming season, Nathan's going to play and we're going to take a minute to look to Jesus, the one who's making all things new. The Lord's Prayer will be on the screen. Our Father, 
May your kingdom come, your will be done. Take time to move in prayer with each other as we respond.